Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Clayton Newt's Generative AI vodcast series. I'm your host, Will Howe. I lead Clayton Newt's data analytics capability where we are building with generative AI technologies. In this series, we explore generative AI and how it impacts the legal sector. This particular episode is around next generation views, and I'm really excited to have four fantastic colleagues of mine uh, on with me today to discuss different elements of generative AI. So uh, Tim Edstein, Tim is a lawyer in our banking practice. And he does a lot of regulatory work and is really interested in the application of generative AI technology to the banking sector. Amina Basirovic, she's a graduate lawyer who has a keen interest in generative AI in the law. And Amina has experience in intellectual property and technology and major projects in construction. We also have uh, Jeremy McCallhorn. Uh, Jeremy was a guest on our previous episode where we talked about the workplace relations issue. Uh, Jeremy, good to have you back. Thanks for thanks for being on board again. And Paul Tui has a background in data science, artificial intelligence, and also has a unique background in film and design. So he's a consultant in the forensic technology services division and has a keen interest in this as well. So um, welcome, guys. Really excited to have you all uh, for this episode. And we're going to cover some really interesting ground on governance of AI, on Australia's national interests, on ethics, and importantly, what does this mean for our career path as a lawyer? So maybe we start with governance. And now, Amina, what have you seen in terms of how do we actually govern this stuff? Well, Will, um, if we start this analysis in the private, private sector, there are really two emerging approaches to how generative AI is being regulated in the space. So on the one hand, you have companies such as OpenAI that are self-governing in the space through limited release strategies, monitored use of models, and controlled access to their commercial products like DALI-E. And on the other hand, you have other companies like Stability AI that really believe that these models should be openly released to democratize access. So Stability AI has, for instance, open sourced its models, which allows developers to access the code and start using it with little to no controls. And as for the public sector, there is still relatively little to no regulation in Australia to govern um, the evolving landscape of generative AI. Um, Australia seems to be approaching the regulation of AI through soft law principle based approach. So the Department of In Industry, um, Science, Energy and Resources has released a set of voluntary ethical principles, which businesses and governments can choose to adopt um, in the development, the design and the use of AI. However, this certainly isn't the case globally, and there are a few key developments that happened over the last year um, that I think we should touch on. So, for example, in December 2022, the Council of the European Union adopted its common position on the Artificial Intelligence Act, which categorizes AI by the risk that they um, pose, and then they impose highly prescriptive requirements on the systems that they consider to be high risk. And this legislation is largely extraterritorial in the sense that they will apply to systems that are used both in the EU, but also foreign systems whose outputs um, go to the EU. In the US, there has been developments um, in Congress to the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. And this legislation seeks to regulate al algorithmic decision-making, which is essentially a system that analyzes large amounts of data um, to infer correlations. One last example, earlier this year, China, in China, the Cyberspace Administration enacted regulations on deep synthesis technology, which includes deep fakes, and the rules place significant restrictions on AI generated media, which requires them to be identified as AI generated through things such as watermarks. So, in this context, it may just be an advantage for Australia to review the approach that has been taken globally and then see what works, see what inadvertently might stifle innovation and be really selective in the kind of, in the kind of inspiration we take, I guess, from other states in designing our own regulation and approach to AI. Sounds like there's there's a lot going on in different jurisdictions, and and like you say, it may be prudent to actually see how this stuff plays out. And so, um, Tim, I know that you spend a lot of your time working with the banking sector, and that this must be a priority for them. Uh, what do you see going on in the FS space? I think in the FS space right now, especially as uh, Amina has mentioned about the two different type of models by private sector players on AI, the second model being the democratization of AI. I see that as a bigger threat to the banks rather than a benefit as if let's say anyone can just buy any AI tool and capabilities, there's a huge potential of people writing malicious 
for example, a malicious hacking code or writing a malicious call center script pretending to be a bank staff that um, if you could deploy other technologies such as generative voice where it's, for example, you're having someone having an Australian accent calling into Australia and the AI is just writing a script, an automated script that can help uh, the scammer, you know, identify and respond to, to a client. It, it's very hard for that client to think, that person to think, this is not my bank calling me versus currently now, most people pick up a scam from someone with an accent from different jurisdiction or if a text message, whether spelling or grammar is incorrect, like very lower level stuff. And as this stuff's getting cheaper um, and the cost of AI is getting cheaper and these tools, it's a lot, the cost benefit analysis for a malicious organized crime group using these tools will become, it, it will be easier for them to deploy. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, Tim. As, as much as we see lots of great opportunities you know, unfortunately, there's opportunities for the scammers in this technology as well, too. And so the banks will really need to think about how they stay ahead of that. And actually, we touch on this in, in an episode of this podcast on fraud. Um, and now, um, Paul, where do you see this governance piece really kicking off? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the major concerns here are these sort of guardrails that have been put in place to prevent anything rather than to respond to anything. And I think a good example to sort of think about is, is comparing this to genetic research. Um, that's just something that's just come top of my mind is that we've sort of taken the risk of what, what that could potentially do to a society and to culture, and we've, we've taken measures to prevent that. Um, so I think it's going to be a major thing to, to, to be considering, especially you can you know, that we've been talking about how a lot of this technology is quite open. It's open source. So there's a lot of different actors that can get involved. And that has a lot of benefits as well. You know, we're, we're considering here at the firm about how to implement a lot of these sort of technologies locally. Um, but I think an important factor for governance is just where is this, the scope of this? How do we how do we limit the application of AI, especially when it comes to, you know, access to different data sources and databases? We just want to sort of make sure that we're all just slowing the progress down, even though you know, we want things to accelerate as quickly as possible. That's good insights, Paul. Thanks. And uh, and Jeremy, what thoughts do you have on the governance piece? Yeah, so, I mean, touching or well, springing from what Paul was just mentioning on, you know, putting the brakes on this sort of thing. Um, I was reading an article earlier um, about uh, this is sort of like the new nuclear um, arms race almost um, and people likening it to, you know, hold on, we really need to, think about what we're doing and, you know, put the brakes and take it slowly because if we don't, you know, we're going to have these malicious actors who can potentially use it for all these um, malicious and nefarious purposes. Um, so I think, and, and the way the technology works as well, obviously, you know, as it gets better, it's sort of uh, to a, to the nth degree sort of betters itself in a way as well. I mean, that's, the, the fear with AI, isn't it? That it will just um, suddenly take off and we won't be able to control it. But I, I think there's definitely going to be some interesting developments um, over the next few years, for sure. Uh, Australia, as uh, Amina, Amina has um, mentioned, has taken a more of a soft approach uh, so far. But uh, for example, you know, I saw uh, an article the other day reporting that uh, the Labor MP, Julian Hill, he actually used his first uh, parliament, parliamentary speech to talk about, you know, AI and the potential impact and he doesn't sound too keen on it, but um, it's, yeah. So he wants to develop a white paper into this space and see what's um, what we can do from the regulatory perspective and take it seriously. Cause I think obviously that's what we need to do. Now it's interesting to talk about, Australian government, and maybe actually that's a good opportunity to move on to our national strategic interest in this. And Jeremy, maybe we'll we'll stick with you. Um, there's obviously a lot of going on in the world, and you know, big developments in the United States and in China, for example. What's the strategic and sovereign play for Australia in all this? Yeah. Um, so obviously, again, this sort of technology is going to change the way the world works, and you know, not only from a commercial perspective, but for that that sovereign national interest perspective as well from national security, defense, and all those fun things. Just some, some numbers, just, you know, to give uh, some, some numbers around the scale of what AI is going to impact the world with, you know, it's expected the global GDP is going to grow by something like $15 trillion by 2030. Um, 
productivity is going to increase by 40%. The number of AI startups in themselves has uh, increased by 14 times, I think it was, over the last two decades. So it is a huge area which, you know, to maintain our, our sovereign interest, we're going to have to see government investment, development, um, and protections put in place. The federal government did uh, invest, I think it was $30 million to advance AI machine learning. Um, there are projects from CSIRO and Standards Australia to try and um, make sure that our national interests, uh, we're, we're part of the conversation at a, a global level to make sure our cultural and natural, national interests are being taken into account in the development of these things. Um, and another really interesting point, in, which is something that has come up and I'm sure will come up again in this podcast, is the, the data side and, and the privacy of citizens. Um, as Australian citizens, we tend to, I think we tend to take our privacy quite seriously. Um, and we really, you know, we have what we're seeing from the Attorney General's department at the moment, a review or a report into the Privacy Act and how that might need to be reviewed to make sure that as a sovereign nation, our, our data is being protected as well. Right, and there's a lot to that point, our data flowing right offshore. Um, mm. Is that okay? In some ways it's okay, but is there risk that sort of need to be managed with that? And um, Amina, I'd love to get your thoughts in this space as well. Yeah, absolutely. So just jumping off those figures that Jeremy raised, um, it really looks like Australia is investing quite a lot in this space, but I think it's important to remember that this is quite new. And up until now, our involvement in the AI space has been quite opportunistic. So to kind of couch that in, in what that means is that just last year, the um, Global AI Readiness Index, which is um, conducted by Oxford Insights, ranked Australia 10th in the world in terms of readiness to adopt AI and the advantages of AI um, in its in its governance um, and government-led initiatives. And a big part of this is that it, Australia's local industry is less developed and competitive than other areas of the world. And for instance, in comparison, in comparison to our other high achieving economies around the world, like the US, where they have the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative, or through Germany, through their artificial intelligence strategy, where the emphasis in these countries is really on investing in the development of world-class intellectual property through fundamental AI research, um, rather than just translating what is already known. So I think that the coordination um, and national priorities in, in AI can really help to drive um, economic impact in Australia and really should be a priority. Thanks, Mina. And, and Tim, I know in the financial services and banking space, there's always been a real focus on our domestic capability. Do you see the same thing playing out in this AI space? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the major banks, Westpac, has recently announced that they will be deploying a chat GPT-like solution into their banks. Um, and this type of solution is will also drive, um, for example, an easier form for the compliance teams, where, there, where there's tasks that's currently that's a bit more manual, where there's a lot of review or um, monitoring of, for example, transactions. AI will definitely be assisting that, that space for the moment. And I see in, in Australia, a lot of technology investments has been historically been driven by the big four banks. And that's, and as you can see in, in Australia, where our banking system has led up to instantaneous transaction payment terms, such as pay ID and now pay two is going to be released. So that's just one example of this, just tech investment that's really been driven by the banking sector rather than just generally in other sectors in the Australian economy. And that's just obviously my banking bias towards it, but that's just my violence towards um, how AI will be developed in Australia. Thanks, Tim. Paul, what's your thoughts around Australia's national interest here? Well, I, I know I, I did read that we've developed roughly, I think, four, four centres that are called AI Digital Capability Centres. Um, they've, been, they've been created nationally so that we can help connect small and medium-sized businesses to you know, reskill up and, and then figure out, I guess, new ways to provide these services with AI. Um, I, I think there's a there's a lot of increasing like I mean recently there's been a lot probably from since 2019 and then from 2022 probably where it really started to pick up. Um, you know I, I think there needs to be a lot more 
of funding going into this space. But it, it kind of reminds me that this sort of mirrors the same sort of fascination that we had with um, cryptocurrency and the blockchain only recently. And it feels like that, fa- like that, that, that has all faded away. And then all of a sudden we've picked up this interest and taken on board with the AI. And I mean, we, we've got to remind ourselves that like AI is, I, sp- I suppose, you know, fundamentally a lot of just algorithms and, and sort of black box learning. So it's been around for quite a while and it's just sort of, okay, where exactly are we, I guess, developing these new, these new, you know, new skills? Yeah. That's, that's a great insight, Paul. And obviously as a data scientist, you rightfully call out, it's just an algorithm behind the scenes, right? But there's implications of these algorithms. But I'd love to touch maybe on the ethics point next. And obviously as we roll those algorithms out, you know, it's really important mm. in a safe way, in, in a sustainable way, and in a way that reflects um, the ethical priorities that the Australian society would want. What sort of considerations do you see us having around ethics and AI? Well, we, we, we touched upon data quite a few times, especially, you know, us as a sovereign nation, we want to be protecting our own data you know domestically and we've, we've had a lot of concerns and, and issues around that and, and it's a it's a catch-22 because a lot of these sort of ai uh, models are built on the fact that the only way you can really improve them is giving them more data um and so it's like okay where are we going to get this data from are we able to sort of protect this data uh which which then you know comes into the the question of what's the ethics of what what data can you actually provide where can we find ownership of this data who owns this data and in particular, you know, are we able to sort of copyright the import data itself? You, you know, if, if an import is not just sort of like training data, but also like an input, like a prompt to generate an image or to generate a piece of text, are we able to sort of consider that that itself can be protected? Um, and then furthermore, you know, is there is the reach to be able to copyright what that output is, um, especially when that output is you know, potentially based on other people's work? It's, it's it's certainly a question to be considering. Uh, there's there's quite a bit to unpack in there. Maybe Amina yeah. might go to you next to sort of have a bit of a think about the ethical points. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with Paul that data is a big part of the debate on ethics. Taking a step back, though, one thing that I'm interested in exploring lately is when we're looking at building ethical AI models, um, is thinking about how they're actually being developed and distinguishing between company standards standards and policies on AI and community standards. So absolutely, it's really common practice right now for these really big tech companies to have their own ethical policies. So your Microsoft, Intel and IBM all have really well developed and published ethical policies on the development of their, their AI. But the question here becomes is, are these kind of company policies um, enough in the ethical space? And in answering this, I think it's always interesting to turn our mind to back in 2020, when Microsoft came up with a policy that it would not release its facial recognition technology and sell it on to police departments. And so at the time, their policies were really well documented and they governed the use of these um, really powerful facial recognition AI. Um, However, in saying this, there were also not community-wide standards. So then you had companies that were happy to sell on uh, similar technologies. And this is exactly what Clearview did. They developed a similar technology and sold it on to police agencies, over 2,000 in the US, that went on to use a technology. And I raise this because it's an example of what happens when there are company-specific policies, but no community-wide standards. Um, And what happens is, while company A might have really strong ethical underpinnings to its development of generative AI or otherwise, um, if company B doesn't, then society is left in a position where it's as if no one has it. And of course, the follow-up question to that is, okay, well, what are the key ethical concerns with generative AI specifically? And I agree with my colleagues that the biggest one is bias in data. And I think this problem isn't inherently linked with the technology itself, but because this technology feeds and depends on large amounts of data to learn, um, if the data that they are provided is biased, that leads us into a big problem. Another problem is also the accuracy accuracy of the data. So for those of us who have used ChatGPT, it's really easy to assume that it's quite reliable and truthful in its answers, but dig a bit deeper and you'll find that that's not always the case. And Data, of course, can be poisoned, it can be false, it can be duplicated. There are quite a lot of problems that can come out of um, data that isn't good. But a positive to this angle is that 
toolkits that can detect and possibly mitigate the effects of this kind of data are already being imagined. So there's kind of two approaches to it. Um, and the first is reinforcement, reinforcement learning through human feedback, um, where humans are involved in responding to the data and feeding that back in. Um, but the other view is also quite a bit more optimistic where we can develop tools that, for the AI, where the AI does it itself. Um, so in summary, I think that we need to be really cognizant of these kinds of issues when developing the AI so that we're not dealing with um, the fire at the end and just trying to put it out. And Amina, that's that's some very insightful thoughts on bias. And, uh, and maybe Jeremy, I'd, I'd love your thoughts because obviously in the workplace relations space, there's a lot of work that goes into thinking around bias and how to make sure that we we remove that. Um, what's your thoughts on sort of the ethics of AI and from a workplace angle, how is that being handled? Yeah, so definitely agree with, with Paul and Amina, um, the data and, you know, making sure that these systems are developed in such a way that they are going to act ethically, probably two of the biggest points. Um, I suppose an, another point though to consider would possibly be the the transparency and the explainability and it sort of comes back to what amina was saying with the development of these uh technologies as well in that they need to be developed in a way where you can uh, check them you can see how the decisions are being made from the data because it's only when you have that level of oversight that you're able to rely on the ai to make a decision and when it does make a decision that hopefully maybe a human will pick up on if it's a bit of a strange decision you're able to go back into the system and say well this is why the ai has made the decision that way based on the data and its algorithm that is programmed into it and it's through that uh, constant feedback loop that you're able to actually improve these things to make sure and and this is you know you see this uh, repeated throughout a lot of different uh, ethics frames works on AI around the world at the moment is that the the primary consideration is making sure that these systems act in the public good and for the benefit of humankind um, ho holistically. So uh, by having that transparency piece in place, you can actually make sure that these things are, are being checked and uh, you know the accountability as well. I think it's going to be an interesting question on where accountability and liability lie for the decisions that get made by, especially by these automated decision makers. Um, you know, you can't really hold the AI itself liable. So who is liable? Is it, the, is it the company that created and programmed the algorithm? Is it, for example, the employer that's relied on this decision to terminate their employee? Or is it the, the company that's, sold the data to the algorithm in the first place. So there's a, there's a lot of different thoughts about, you know, where that accountability might lie, but I think that's obviously something as far as our ethical uh, obligations go, s someone that does need to be accountable at the end of the day, because that's how you make sure things are done properly and, and for the good of humanity. Your, your point on explainability is a really interesting one and well-placed and obviously with some of this tech, it's actually early in the game. It's a little bit difficult sometimes to get it to explain how it's making a decision and why. And I know Tim in your space, in the banking space, being able to explain how decisions were come to that, that's extremely important. What's your thoughts about the ethics space, Tim? So with the ethics space and AI and going back to Amina's point about unconscious bias and you know, getting that AI getting a feedback loop on, for example, who's a we could use credit assessments as, as a good example of who's a high credit risk and who's a low credit risk. Um, when, when I was doing this, when I was doing a banking law course in university, I had a professor who always brought it up why that the biggest threat to future and banking and credit and providing people services is that with so much data that's going out out there, it's very easy for an organization to figure out someone's uh, you know, sensitive personal information just by pure data alone. So you can you can pick up someone's certain habits, whether they're of a certain religion, whether they have, um, if you can look at transactional data to see, you know, their spending shopping habits, whether they gamble a lot, whether they, you know, buy healthy foods, whether they buy unhealthy foods. And in, in, in our sectors, you know, a bank could theoretically discriminate against certain people 
either by their ethnic origin or by their um, cultural or cultural origin or by their religious um, beliefs, just just basing it off certain habits that someone has. So an, an example would be if someone goes to church on a Sunday and then they wear a Fitbit and then it geotracks them that they go to the same location every day, you can tell this person's of a certain religion. And this goes to, you know, and a person attempt going to any religious organizations and it belongs to any religious groups. And it, it's a it's a big problem if an AI intrinsically thinks, okay, a person of this certain demographic is a high credit risk, even though this person may have a higher income for now, does the AI's bias go, we're not going to lend them this amount because people of this demographic has popped up before as a red marker for defaulting on, on, um, on credit. So that's always, that's always going to be a big issue. I think that's that's going to face the banks if they deploy this type of technology, particularly in this type of uh, credit assessment space. And privacy is always going to become a bigger and bigger issue as more and more of the stuff is getting collected, especially when um, a lot of people bank on apps through their phones and a lot of a lot of it's asking for people's location when people click that accept button the phones will know basically can theoretically track the banks can track where people are going in their day-to-day -day activities that's that's a really good point tim on some of the changes that are going to be required to mm -hmm. your point credit assessment there's there's a lot of work put in by the banks on ensuring that uh, there's elements of the bias that are that are removed from that and so maybe just along the topic of skill sets and those changing skill sets maybe just love to touch on what's going to change for lawyers. And as we're thinking about our career in the legal industry, what do we need to prioritize and how does this sort of change things? And maybe Tim, it'd be good to start off with yourself. What's your view on, on legal careers and how they may or may not change because of generative AI? It will definitely change quite a lot with generative AI becoming a different tool. Um, it's like the invention of the calculator or in the current finance space, if someone's using Excel, just because someone's, you know, you have to learn the baseline math skills to understand what the inputs are. An Excel or a calculator will give you the output, but you have to know how to use that tool as well. So learning to use chat GPT or generative AI tool will in itself be a skill. I think an easy example for us lawyers is that in, in law school, they do teach us how to do legal research. Like you have to use, you know, bullion cues and using the different various sources like LexisNexis or Westlaw. Um, Osley is one of them that they've, that we've all, that I've been taught when I was at university. And um, currently I see ChatGPT, it, it, it does give an answer that it's very confident in, but uh, there's been a few reports where there's a University of Michigan Law School where they use ChatGPT to answer four questions, uh, four different law exams. I think one's in torts, one's in evidence, and one's in governance. I forgot the fourth one, but it's it did pass the exams, but it consistently scored at the bottom scale and placed last in the rankings. And the commentary was that it gave very high level detail and it was very confident, but it didn't provide any nuance. So that's the big caveat for young lawyers trying to use ChatGPT, um, trying to use it for as an actual legal research tool. Um, one benefit I do think that the tool has at the moment would be saving a lot of time. Like it's very good at its natural language capabilities where it's you can ask it to fix grammar and draft things in a certain tone like that would save generally quite a lot of time and i think um that's going to change the nature of our work as lawyers where we're going to be more thinking on the strategic side and we're more manual tasks um like writing out advice or like reviewing documents would become more and more um being deployed and used by ai Thanks, Tim. That's a really interesting points about some of the changing skill sets. And uh, Paul, I mean, from your perspective, as you rightfully call out, it's just algorithms. And for yourself as a data scientist, you must see some of these different changing skill sets a lot. Where do you see some of the changes for legal careers? I think I think to jump off what Tim was saying, you know, this is um, this is making things easier and quicker. So just uh, you know, to do a summary to 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 to, to create um, you know a, a document based on just a, a simple input. These language models are, are going to be really useful, uh, almost to the equivalent of what like a, a search engine has been in the past. Um, so I think this is going to be a fantastic assistance just for for everybody. And I think that's that's probably the main thing that I sort of see as like a, a great takeaway here is that it's going to just 
bring up the standard of, of what anyone can do. And that's exactly the same as what happened with, you know, coming from my, my sort of graphic and film background is what happened with, with Canva, the Australian company Canva, where all of a sudden everyone had the access to creating documents that were beautiful. They didn't have to just depend on clip art or any sort of other sort of imagery. This was just something you could generate very quickly. You didn't have to have a background in it. Um, and the same with Squarespace as well. All of a sudden you could just create a beautiful website. Here I am. Um, this is a sponsor, sponsored by Squarespace here. Um, it would generate like a, a beautiful website without having to, to, to do anything, no coding, no nothing. Um, and I feel like it's the same here. The only drawback, of course, is that it just means that everything's going to become a little bit more standardized. Like, I think we're going to have less differences in, in, in how we're potentially writing. Um, and I think that's going to be fascinating to see in the space is like how much, like how would we actually identify between two different people's writing styles if we're all just starting to use the same tool? Lots of changes coming up for sure, Paul. And, and Amina, your thoughts, legal career. Yeah, I think that to start with, just picking up on some common themes um, that were mentioned by Paul and Tim in the sense that generative AI is a tool at the end of the day. And I think that it's important to remember it, that, that, that that's what it is. Um, and it might be called to tackle some of the more repetitive tasks that we might face in the legal profession, but I don't think that it's going to be replacing lawyers anytime soon. It just means that lawyers might, without having to do those repetitive tasks, have the opportunity to turn their mind to the creative and strategic legal problem solving a lot earlier in their careers. Um, and I think an interesting point that I heard at the World Economic Forum this year is that there was a study that was discussed, um, which looked at 950 occupations. And in that study, not a single occupation could be totally wiped out by the use of AI. In every single industry, um, human involvement is still very fundamental. So I think this just means that we're not going to be replaced anytime soon. Um, and it certainly won't happen to whole occupations at a time. But I think that the interesting part is having to reimagine how tasks are handled by, handled by us and restructuring work um, to handle the involvement of both AI and um, the elements that cannot be handled by AI and still require human involvement. And I think just as a general um, point in this kind of discussion, I think it's a really exciting time to be starting a career in law. Um, at this moment, lawyers are seeing so much disruptive technologies um, in the industry with AI, algorithmic governance, you've got blockchain technology, fintech, big data. I think that there's going to be some of the fastest regulatory challenges. And if you are a young lawyer that has an interest in these technologies and has some sort of knowledge about it, I think it's a really good opportunity to get involved and take an active role in shaping the legal landscape. Um, so in short, I don't think that junior lawyers um, should be worried when they're looking into the legal landscape. Um, I think it's just really import important to be cognizant of what you as an individual are doing to leverage this AI, because it won't be AI that's going to take your job, but it might be people who can leverage and use it that will. Very strong remarks, Amina. Thank you for that. Thank you, Amina. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and thank you, Paul. I uh, really appreciate having you on. And thank you to you, the folks watching and listening to this. And we hope you enjoyed this one, and we will see you at the next one.